on Sunday mornings here at Horse Cave Baptist, I am preaching through the small New Testament book of Titus. Uh, Titus is uh, three chapters long, and yet I'm beginning to find several things in there that have been challenging, encouraging, and really relate to today. What you find in the book of Titus is that there's a group of churches who are living in a culture that at best was indifferent, at worst was hostile toward them, and they were trying to learn how to live the Christian life. That's exactly where we are today. Either people are indifferent to our message, or they're hostile to our message. So I've gained a lot of understanding as I've read through the book of Titus. Titus was one of Paul's helpers, and Titus and and Paul and two or three other men had been led by the Holy Spirit to go to an island called Crete, which is in the Mediterranean Sea, just below Greece and Turkey. And as they were going from town to town, they were finding churches who had just organically sprung up after representatives of the Jewish community had been there on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. So they're finding these churches that have gotten started because they've heard about the message of Jesus, but they are doctrinally confused and their lifestyles were not reflecting uh, the moral standards that you find in the scripture. So Paul leaves Titus and these other men there to go back through all the churches they had found and to, first of all, set up elders and overseers, leaders in the church. Now these leaders had certain uh, ethical standards they need to live by, and they also need to understand what doctrine to teach. In uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 9, uh, Paul writes through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, talking about leaders. He said, He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he may encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Now, the word sound is where we get the word hygiene. In other words, we might call this clean doctrine. Clean doctrine means doctrine that's consistent, doctrine that has the power to change your heart, your mind, and your will. It is the kind of doctrine that reflects who Jesus is, who reflects what God had sent him to do, and even gives pictures of the Holy Spirit in his working. The word doctrine means the body of theological teachings that sets parameters around our Christian belief, telling us what is acceptable and what is not acceptable in belief and practice. What makes Christianity different from other faith groups like Judaism, Islam, Hindu? What makes us different is important to recognize that each group has an ethic ethical standard. In other words, all these groups have pretty much the same kind of ethical standards. You're not to steal. You're not to kill. You're to be faithful to your spouse. You're All these things, every faith teaches these. But the difference between Christianity and every other faith group is this. God grants salvation based on Christianity to those who believe by faith that Jesus and His death on the cross was sufficient to cover my sin that God has now justified me before Him, and I'm His child forever. And then that leads me to do good works, ethical living. In all these other groups, their idea is you live by these ethical standards for the purpose of earning your salvation, and therefore God will allow you into His kingdom. That's exactly the opposite, and it's important to realize that distinction. Only Christianity gives the idea that by faith through grace in Jesus will God grant us and give us everlasting life. Now, how do you find distinctions within the Christian doctrine? In other words, what are the teachings that we have that are absolutely essential to receive God's grace? In other words, you would say, what are the doctrines that are essential for us to have everlasting life, to even be called a Christian? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, what we have here is a, a beautiful picture of 
the gospel and what we need to realize about the doctrines that we believe. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I have received, I pass on to you as a first importance. Now remember that phrase, as a first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised the third day according to the scriptures, and they appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. Now think of that phrase. Paul said the gospel of Jesus is of first importance. There are many doctrines in the scriptures and it helps to know how do you group them together. In other words, certain doctrines seem to stay in the same classifications. Others seem to be connected in another group. And sometimes it can be a little confusing. I mean, what doctrines relate to this subject? What doctrines relate to that subject? What doctrines relate to our salvation? What doctrines relate to our ethical living as Christians? And it's easy to get confused, and it's worth knowing because there is some doctrines where there's room for disagreement. There's other doctrines to where there is no room for disagreement. How do you know which one it is? Well, back in 2005, Dr. Al Albert Moeller, who is the president of the Theological Seminary in, in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, he published what he called the Theological Triage. And what that was, was the ability to determine the grouping of the different doctrines. And I have found it to be helpful over the years as I have looked through that. The word triage comes from a French root word, which means to sort. So theological, the things of God, how do we sort them out into groupings so that we can better understand them? Uh, he uses the idea of like uh, a battlefield uh, medic. If there's a lot of wounded men, they would have to go out and triage. They have to decide which one goes to the hospital first, which one goes second, which one goes third, which one is the walking wounded, and he can probably walk back to, uh, to their mass unit. Um, it kind of goes along with like a mass, ca mass casualty event in like a collapse of a building. The first responders will pick who needs to go first, who needs to go second. Uh, in the ER... When a nurse or a doctor, someone's brought in, they have to go through, first of all, is the person breathing? Is his heart beating? Is he bleeding out? And then they get down to what really is taking place. So that's triage. That's trying to determine first important, second important, third important. So what are the essential doctrines that a person must believe to even be called a Christian? That's why I want to take the rest of our time. And I'm going to move through these rather quickly I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I would enjoy that, but I'm just going to go through it quickly so you can get an idea that these are the doctrines that are essential to our faith. First order doctrines are, first of all, the Scriptures. The authority of Scripture. The authority of Scripture means to disbelieve or to disobey any word of God means to disbelieve or disobey God. Now, you need to think on that a while. That's pretty intense. The scriptures are also sufficient, meaning God has told you everything you need to know to believe Him completely and to follow Him perfectly. The scriptures are also inerrant, and that means that the scriptures do not teach anything that's contrary to fact. So, think about it. All of our theological beliefs come from the Bible. If we can't trust the Bible, then our theological beliefs cannot be trusted. Scripture must be trusted because that is where we hear the message of everlasting life. The next doctrine is called the doctrine of creation. The doctrine of creation basically states that a benevolent creator 
spoke everything into existence. And then he created man in his own image from the dirt, from the dust of the ground. The importance of having a divine creator is that if our creation story is a myth, that everything else in the Bible is a myth. But if this is true, then everything else is true. The nature of God is the next doctrine. The scripture says that God is holy, holy, holy. That means completely pure. God judges out of purity. God loves out of purity. The Bible says He is all-knowing, He is all-present, and He is all-powerful. You just have to believe that if you're going to be a Christian. The nature of man is the next doctrine. The Bible tells us that we are sinful, selfish, and depraved. It tells us that we cannot save ourselves. That something from the outside must come in and affect us to change our destiny. The Trinity. The Trinity is that the Godhead is three in one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. This is the most distinctive doctrine from any other faith group. No other faith group has this belief from the scriptures that God is three in one. The deity of Christ. Jesus is the God-man. God became flesh and died. You see, in pagan cultures, they believe that people are to die for their gods. But in Christianity, our God died for us. Justification by faith. Justification is a legal term where God declares sinful people pardoned because of their faith in Jesus Christ and His sufficiency of salvation on the cross. Justification by faith. The next doctrine is the atonement. The atonement basically saying that we are, slave, we are saved by the atoning work of Jesus on the cross, meaning that His death on the cross provided covering for our sin, and now we can be accepting that. We are now acceptable to God. The old song, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other fountain I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's the atonement. The next doctrine that is just absolutely necessary to believe to be saved is the resurrection. Jesus said that he would die, be buried, and come back after three days. And that's exactly what he did. If Jesus had not accomplished that, Christianity would be completely false. The last of the, what we would call first order doctrines, is final judgment. The great white throne judgment when God will judge all those who have refused to accept Christ as Lord and Savior, and they will be cast into the lake of fire for eternity. And then there is the great, then there, there is the judgment seat of Christ, where Jesus then will judge all those who have trusted Him as Lord and Savior, not to determine whether they go to heaven or not. That's already been decided on earth when you trust and accept Him by faith. No, that judgment is to determine what have you done with what Jesus gave you. And Jesus said, some will suffer loss, and some will gain through that. Basically, what did you do with what Jesus gave you? It's going to be the ultimate of holding you responsible and accountable in your life. When it comes to determining what is first order doctrines, it's going to help us to ask ourselves a few questions. And we're going to conclude with this. Ask yourself this question. How do these doctrines affect a person's eternity? Whatever affects a person's eternity needs to be considered a first order doctrine, as Paul said, of first importance. Second question to ask, is this doctrine worth dying for? If you were in a government on the earth who says you have to deny one or all of these doctrines I just read to you, are they worth denying or are they worth dying for? Anything that's worth dying for is a first order doctrine. Remember, not all Christian churches or denominations are going to agree on all first order doctrines.
but these are historically and biblically what Baptists believe. So in our next video, we're going to look at second order doctrines. So until then, think through this. What are the doctrines that affects a person for eternity? That's first order doctrines. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you have shown us what is true. Thank you that you have given us doctrines to believe and teach that causes people to escape this sinful world, our own sinful behavior, and can spend eternity with you in heaven. Thank you, Father, for clearly writing out, writing it out so that we can understand, we can believe and teach others. In Jesus' name, amen.